your pockets, your phone, your wallet, your passport, those things you just can't lose. Maybe everyone does this, but it took, maybe I'm a slow learner, but it took me years to figure this one out. I put the same things in the same pockets all the time. Never get out of a cab without touching all those pockets and confirming you have all those items. Never get off the plane without touching your pockets and making sure you have all those items. Never leave a hotel. Don't get off a train. Always, always, pat, give yourself a pat down. Do I have the wallet? Do I have the phone? Yes. Is the passport and it's a signed bag on my backpack? Yes. If you're carrying more than one item, always repeat to yourself, I have three items today. I have three items today. I have three items. I have three bags. I have three bags. So that when you arrive at your destination, ah oh yes, I'm carrying three bags today. I gotta find them all. When you're walking and sightseeing, don't hold your phone in your hand out in front of you and stare at it. There's a whole variety of reasons for that. Number one, if you've got an expensive phone and you're traveling in the developed world or the non-developed world, that phone can be half or the entire salary of the average person in that country. Snatchers take them. If you must hold it out, hold it close. Hold it with two hands. Step aside, turn in towards a doorway where nobody can zoom up and grab it and hold it tight when you're out there in public. The next thing is another safety item about walking with your phone. You are unfamiliar with the traffic there. You are unfamiliar with your surroundings. You are unfamiliar with being in a country that has broken pavement or wet slippery tile all over the place. Busy holding your phone, down you go or you get hit. Don't walk around with your phone out. Stop, go somewhere. You're on vacation, you're not in a rush, baby. Enjoy yourself. Next thing, restaurants, never eat anywhere you're invited. If a restaurant is good, it will be full without hiring touts, the people that stand out there and say, oh, hello, my friend, come in, we have special for you, oh, 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 oh. No, if their food was any good, if their service was any good, they don't need to pay someone to try and drag people in by the arm to eat there. Skip it, it's never good. Let's talk some more about overly friendly strangers, all right? People that approach you when you're traveling. They're just oh so charming. Remarkably, in the country you're in, they speak really rather good English. It's easy to fall into the idea that like, oh, I'm having such a wonderful time. This is such a great country and the people are so friendly. Those people make a living approaching foreign travelers. And 95% of the time, they don't make that living honestly. They're scammers. They're gonna lead you into a karaoke bar where suddenly your bill is $350 for one drink and there's some big bruisers offering to take you to the ATM so you can go straight and pull out the cash to pay them. Uh, you'll find your credit card bill manipulated. Pickpockets, they're distracting you while their partner steals your bag or picks your pocket. Don't talk to overly friendly strangers. They're not there to be your friend. They're there to earn a dishonest living. Next thing, and this is something I always practiced when I was uh, working like a, a corporate slave all the time under high stress in the US and I'd have a two week vacation for the whole year to look forward to. A trick I found that worked really well is, you know, you're a stressed out monster, you're tired, you're worn out. Take your vacation at the beginning, at the beach. Fly to a beautiful resort, be spoiled, chill out for a few days, calm down and return into a normal human being. Now I myself, I enjoy the beach, but I don't wanna be there for a week or 10 days. But it's great to decompress. Have your beach time, get on a plane, take a short flight either within the country or to a neighboring country and go to a really cool city. 
someplace where you can now, after you've got your tan and you've got your pina colada and you've got your ocean sunset under your belt, you can go and have some neat cultural stimulation and see a lot of different things than what you saw at the beach. Uh, Cost-wise, generally, once you're overseas like that, in another country, hopping on a one or two hour flight, three hour flight within a time zone or within an hour or two difference is cheap and easy and you get some bang for your buck. Because while beaches are beautiful, let's face it, the beautiful beach is kind of a similar experience with some variation in most countries. Getting to the city and becoming immersed in their culture, that's a totally different experience in every country. These days, travel can be a little more difficult, right, with the COVID protocols and requirements that have popped up around the world. And getting information can be tr challenging. So first of all, on visas, many countries that require a visa have an online facility to apply. When you do your search to look up that site, make sure that if it's a government site that's recommended, a direct government visa site, you find that lots of travel companies and other businesses will put up near replicas of the government site and charge more. Don't fall for it. Find the direct government site. A couple of places to look for travel information and visa information. The U.S. Department of State has a big website about travel to other countries that's worth looking up. You can just type in Google U.S. Department of State Travel Advisory and the name of the country. You'll find some useful information there. I'm going to talk about Facebook sites. Those can be useful too. Another site that I have found useful for country-specific entry requirement information is to, again, go on Google and Google the U.S. Embassy, say, Thailand, U.S. Embassy, Philippines. When I return to the Philippines, because the government structure in the Philippines is kind of fragmented and disjointed, it was very difficult to find a coherent description of all the entry requirements as different government agencies are haphazard in releasing information and making it clear and often don't consult with each other. So you have a hard time finding a unified site. When you search the U.S. Embassy in that specific country, they will generally have the current entry requirements listed in a coherent and comprehensive fashion. So that's yet another spot to look for good visa information. Okay, next I want to talk about food and water when you're traveling. If you're in a developed country with high health standards and high quality water, you don't need to worry about this too much. But when you travel in the developing world, I want to share a few things. One is Pepto-Bismol, or as I call it, pink magic. Years ago, a doctor recommended this to me and said if you're in a sketchy situation, you can even drink a little bit of it before a meal because its ingredients kill the bacteria that give you stomach distress. But better, first of all, to avoid that problem altogether. So bottled water, yes, plastic bottled water, an environmental nightmare, it's your best friend. There's many places where people will drink bottled water but do things like brush their teeth with tap water because they've read it's safe or heard it's safe. In my experience, if you do this in the developing world, maybe not immediately, maybe not always, but eventually and from time to time, you're gonna get stomach problems. I now religiously brush my teeth and rinse with bottled water. Furthermore, if you're preparing food at home, particularly meat or vegetables, wash it in the sink with some dish liquid, then take some bottled water and rinse all of that off with the bottled water. Following these protocols, the times that I've spent with stomach issues, minor or major, has radically declined to nearly nothing. Next is restaurants and street food. Your biggest risk when traveling is raw vegetables for dysentery. 
So you gotta be really careful about what sort of a restaurant you pick, for instance, to order a salad. Really, really cautious. The next is street food. Uh, People get excited about street food. They brag about eating it as showing some kind of great bravery or valor or adventurousness. Of course, if you do that, then you're laid up for three days with diarrhea you're going to regret it. And people don't generally brag about that part of the street food experience. If you must eat street food, look for things that are, for instance, barbecued on a grill on a skewer. Look for things that are cooked hot and then served immediately into a disposable paper container. Don't use street vendor cutlery. Don't go to street vendors that use plates. Usually there's a bucket of horrible water underneath the stand where these plates are rinsed. It's cold and it's full of food debris and primarily it's a breeding ground for bacteria. So really exercise care if you feel that you must eat street food and stay away from the utensils and plates. Try not to let the vendor touch your food directly. It should come straight off the grill and into a disposable clean container. This also goes as a consideration for restaurants or street vendors that have pots or plates or bowls full of pre-prepared dishes. The standard for refrigeration and preservation of food in the developing world is a lot different than the developed world. And items will be left on counters, left in pots, lukewarm or cold for hours. And that's where bacteria forms. Now, the locals can get away with this, perhaps. They're resistant to this type of local bacteria. But you and I are likely not. So anything that's been on display and sitting, ooh, treat it with care. All right, well, I hope this was helpful. And uh, I hope you've enjoyed sharing the view here at the Lobach River Resort. I had a great day riding around yesterday, and today it's going to be a lazy day now that I'm done with this. Thanks for watching. See y'all. Bye.